instruction is developing personal and accessible instruction. Uh, we have a great session on tap for you today. Uh, hopefully everybody is having a good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening, depending on where you're all coming from. Uh, my name is Todd DeSando. I'm one of the instructional technology trainers here at Digital Promise, and uh, I'm going to be your moderator today. So if you have any sort of questions or comments or anything like that, please make sure you put those in the chat and uh, we're gonna get started. Uh, Jessica, can you move to the next slide, please? All right, before we get started, just a few quick um, norms that we need to mention as we uh, begin our session. So number one, please keep your mics muted. Uh, use the chat feature if you, like I said, if you have comments or questions, and of course, uh, reactions are always encouraged. Uh, if you find something especially uh, interesting or you want a champion, by all means, give us those reactions. Number two, uh, the next two are a little bit more meta uh, in nature. So please be mindful of why we're here and the importance of why we're here and be present in that actual moment. Uh, the session that we have together, it's, it's only 60 minutes of us being together. So again, thank you for carving out just uh, a little bit of your day to spend with us. And the last one, and I think it's perhaps the most important norm, be kindful to yourself and to others throughout this entire process. Uh, I wanna just have one little thought that you need to keep in the back of your minds as we're going through this. We're all here because we wanna better ourselves and we wanna see change made within education. So be kind to yourself and be kind to each other. All right, I'm gonna start, um, go ahead, Jessica, next one. I'm gonna start and I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica and I'm gonna introduce her very, very quickly. Uh, Jessica Jackson, who is our facilitator today, she is the Practitioner Partnerships Director at the Learner Variability Project, where she designs professional learning for educators that helps them address the needs of the whole learner throughout research-based practices. Jessica has over 20 years of experience in education as an educator, principal, and instructional leadership coach that reflects her passion for learning sciences and social justice. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica. Thank you, Todd. I am so excited to be here with everyone today. Thank you uh, for being here with me. And so we're gonna dive in. So. If you can open up uh, either your phone or on another screen and go to minty.com and enter this code, I'd love to just start by reflecting on what words come to mind when you think of student agency. And I'm gonna flip over if my screen will allow me that tab so we can kind of see. Mm. Great, I love uh, seeing some of the different words that come up. Of course, choice is featured there in the middle, which means several people are really thinking about that. Um, but I also see, you know, self-driven ownership, structured support, resilience, advocacy, all of these are important pieces of student agency as well. Interest is also important being independent, student-led. Um, so those are all really great examples of, and parts of the student agency piece. Freedom of speech, goal-directed, Having voice as well as choice is great. Differentiated, so student set rigor, interesting, self initiated, uh, lots of great words there. So we're going to dive into this a little bit more um, as we go today. And so um, I am your facilitator. 
but on this slide, uh, this is my Twitter handle as well as my email. And so if you have any questions and I don't get to all of them today, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I would love to follow up with you and, and make sure you're comfortable. And thanks, Todd, for being here with me and keeping an eye on the chat if there's something that I missed. Um, appreciate that. So here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to discover ways to teach learner variability to students in order to support student agency and review examples of how to teach students about learner variability and then spend some time brainstorming activities for your own lessons on learner variability with your students and um, using our learner variability navigator, which is a free uh, tool we have here at Digital Promise. So today we're talking about uh, personal and accessible. And so this is the summer of powerful learning. Personal and accessible is the first uh, principle that we talk about. And so this language on this slide is lifted directly from our uh, site on powerful learning. So I wanna spend a few minutes unpacking this a bit. And uh, so powerful learning must be personal and accessible because every learner is different. And the ways in which we learn are complex and variable. And so that speaks kind of to the learner variability piece that we were talking about. Um, or that we'll be talking more about, but also that learners must have agency to chart their own course, take ownership of their learning and feel safe and supported in doing so. And so a big part of kind of making learning personal and accessible is cultivating agency. And so educators can support this through their choices around pedagogy, use of tools and technology and how they design the learning environment. And all of that is enhanced when you understand learner variability. So, oh, you know what? I'm gonna go back because I'd love to pause here. And this is just an opportunity for you to reflect and put in the chats. Um, I want you to think about a time where you really felt like you had agency over your own learning. And to put that another way, maybe think of a time where you taught yourself something. So maybe it was for work, but maybe it was a hobby or something you were trying to do at home. You know, I'm trying to learn gardening, right? So I'm doing all kinds of things uh, to learn more about that because I do not have a green thumb and naturally in any way. So what, what did you kind of do to learn that? Um, and so when you have agency over your own learning, what are some of the kind of ways that you prefer to learn? Do you watch videos? Do you go on Instagram? Do you talk to experts? Do you read books? Um, these are all things I've kind of thought about as I'm trying to learn something new and different ways that I prefer to do it. So if you want to um, throw some examples in the chat of when you have something you taught yourself and, and what really helped you. Oh, I love this. I learned, thank you, Tess, uh, Portuguese and listening to music in the language. Isn't that interesting? That's so great. Love that example, associating with native speakers. Awesome. Yes, YouTube is a great, when you have agency over your learning, you can learn so much from YouTube. Um, I'm thankful my partner, uh, anytime something breaks, he watches a YouTube video on how to fix it. So it's very handy. Yeah, WikiHow. Yes, that's a great example. Ooh, bird watching. I'd love to know what app you like. I like doing that too. <laughs> Thank you, Noella. Yeah, doing your own research. Learning new tech, exploring on your own. Also great. Yeah, I think it's interesting just to think about sometimes how we learn when we have agency over our own learning versus how we learn in more formalized learning settings. Um, and so I always think it's just interesting to pause and reflect and think about where are the opportunities to blend, you know, and bring more of that in um, to our formal settings. Having a supportive and expert mentor, totally agree. Bernie, I always want to just be able to ask someone my questions right away. Um, so yeah, those are all great examples of that. So what does the research say? 
Um, this came from a really interesting uh, report that I really like. So it's linked here when you access the slide deck if you want to dive into the report a bit more. But I pulled this out because I thought it had some interesting connections to what we were talking about today. And it says that trust and mutual respect between teachers and students are foundational to learning. Um, that's not rocket science. I think we all know how important teacher-student relationships are. But for students to succeed, they must also develop a sense of themselves as learners who belong in an academic setting and who can persist and improve through focused effort. And I think about this, you know, some of the things you put in the Mentimeter around um, resilience and things like that, that's part of the student agency, right? Like being able to persist, but also that they really, that students understand themselves as learners and that they feel like they belong. Those are really important pieces um, to making sure that learning is personal and accessible um, and that we are cultivating uh, student agency. And so this is where, again, um, understanding learner variability can help because there is no such thing as an average learner or a one size fits all. And so the more we understand um, the learners look a lot of different ways, the more we can make sure that students feel accepted um, for who they are and, and feel like they belong in that academic setting. So I'd love for you to think about maybe, I, I don't know if some of you may still be in school finishing up and some of you are done, but I would love for you to think back on some of the students that you encountered this past year and kind of, you don't have to put anything in the chat, but just take a minute and think like, do you think all of your students see themselves as someone who belongs in that academic setting. And think about maybe some of your students who struggle more or you know, who have historically been marginalized or excluded. What would it take to make them feel like they belong in that academic setting? So it's just an idea to kind of hold on to and think about as we kind of move forward today. But I did want to get to this idea of learner variability that I've mentioned, because um, as you know, I work with the Learner Variability Project. So um, when we're talking about learner variability, we are talking about the recognition that each student has a unique set of strengths and challenges across a whole child framework that are interconnected and vary according to context. So I'd love to see in the reactions, is, is this a kind of understanding about learner variability that you're familiar with, or and maybe you could give me a thumbs up, or if this is new to you or you're not sure, you can give me a face emoji of some kind. <laughs> of, of, you know, I see a couple of thumbs up there, so people have heard of this before. Great. So a couple of things I wanted to emphasize here is that when we're talking about learner variability, we are talking about each student. Um, this is not something, you know, with just referring to students with diagnosed disabilities or something like that, but everybody has learner variability. And that when we're thinking about that learner variability, we are considering both the strengths and the challenges. So oftentimes our school systems are designed to identify the challenges and provide intervention and support for those. But it is really important to kind of have this more holistic view where we think about those strengths as well and really understand how to help students leverage their strengths in academic settings. And so having this whole child framework where we think beyond just academics to consider cognitive factors, social and emotional factors, and student background factors really help us um, understand children and our students more holistically. And that these factors are interconnected, they can impact one another, and that they can really change according to context. So what shows up in a strength in one context may be a weakness in another. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is, is background knowledge. So when I think about my own agency over my learning, uh, if I'm learning something for work, which I have a lot of background knowledge for, I can read a lot of complex research and, and for long periods of time. But uh, if I'm trying to learn something new, like gardening or how to manage my finances, <laughs> my background knowledge, not so deep. And therefore my working memory, I, I can only do things for short periods of time before I get really like overwhelmed. 
So it's just really interesting, you know, how the, that same factor can show up as both a strength and a challenge across contexts. So one other important note that I am obligated to say is that learner variability is, is not the same as learning styles. And so oftentimes people think, oh yeah, learner variability, it's like learning styles. And so learning styles is the idea that uh, people are auditory, kinesthetic, or visual learners. But uh, what, when we use that, it often pigeonholes kids into being one way all the time. And it doesn't take into account um, the context and how those things can change according to context. And so learning styles is actually not backed by research, but we, what research does show is that doing multi-modalities, like doing all three, you know, consistently helps students process new information into long-term memory. Um, but you don't want kids to associate that they can only learn one way because in fact, often the opposite is true. They can learn multiple ways um, when they're engaged in multimodal instruction. So what are some things that you can do to support learner variability in your classroom? I wanna start with, these are four practices. You may already be doing a lot of these, but um, you know, this is kind of a good, place to start and say like, how much am I doing this consistently? And so the first is just to reflect on your own learner variability and how that shows up in your teaching. So I've linked here a, a self-reflection, which you can use along with our adult learner model to just kind of reflect on how do your own like experiences as the learner show up? Um, and, and how does that affect, you know, the strategies you like to use, how you teach things, you know, um, and I think it's just kind of interesting, the more you understand your own learner variability and how that changes when you're teaching yourself something versus when you're learning something from someone else, the better you can appreciate some of the ways your students may be different um, or have different needs from you. And so uh, the second thing I would say is just to foster that sense of belonging. And so here I linked to one of the factors, uh, our sense of belonging factor on the learner variability navigator. So this, when you come to the navigator, if you haven't seen it before, we have seven learner models that you can choose from. And so we're, I'm in the literacy 712 model right now. And we have many different factors. This is sense of belonging. And what you have here is a summary of the research. It's showing you how this factor is connected to other factors in our whole child framework. And it includes um, strategies that support that factor. But when we're talking about sense of belonging, I think some of the key things that are important to note in the summary here is that sense of belonging is tied to our own identities and that it is, um, context and culture dependent. And so school settings have the potential to be a source of adversity, or they can be a supportive environment, uh, fostering positive identity. And so really understanding that I think is important. Students who report a stronger sense of belonging in school have greater self-efficacy and academic success. And so understanding the different aspects of our identity, which can intersect with our environment, include race, gender, sexual orientation, class, disability, and immigrant status, just to name a few. And those are ones that may be known to us as we work with students, but there can also be um, concealed or hidden identities that we may not know about, such as mental health, um, learning disabilities, body images, other things. Um, and so it's important just to understand that all of this can impact uh, the sense of belonging uh, the students feel. And so kind of keeping that in mind is helpful. And then if you're like, gosh, I didn't, you know, where do I start with all of that? Well, here are some strategies. Many of these may be strategies that you are already familiar with, but again, kind of using them intentionally to foster belonging in students, uh, especially ones that you may be concerned don't feel that sense of belonging. So we have everything from building trusting relationships and building empathy to discussing race with students, incorporating students' cultural practices, even just kind of developing authentic audiences and purposes, which speak to students' backgrounds and other things can be great. And so these strategies um, also are based in research and they include videos um, and 
as well as additional resources to support implementation. So this is just a great way to kind of dive into the research and get a very high level summary around a specific factor like sense of belonging and identify strategies which support it. The other thing, of course, which many of you already note, uh, noted in our Mentimeter word cloud is providing more voice and choice wherever you can. And so that can look like a lot of different ways using frameworks like universal design for learning, um, but also just helping break a task down into different components like must do, should do, aspire to do. But I think that's also important when we're adding that voice and choice to pay attention to what are our kids choosing? And how does that speak to their strengths, their preferences as learners? And how can we you know, name that for them um, as they're making those uh, choices? And so one way you can do that is with wise feedback. Uh, there's lots of ways that you can give feedback to students, different types of feedback, growth mindset feedback, strengths-based feedback. And so um, this is just another way. And there's a this links to a video if you want to kind of get get a deeper dive on what this is. But it this really helps um, you understand uh, why feedback communicates both high expectations, but also a belief that students can accomplish that, which is really important, as well as, you know, some critical feedback on whatever it is that they're learning. So, you know, you know, I know you can you're going to, you know, finish this task and you always, you know, put a lot of effort in and you persist even when the going's tough. And so one thing I want you to do is go back and reread, you know, those kind of things, but you're communicating a high expectation along with that belief is really important. And those are, uh, that wise feedback helps them understand themselves as learners. So those are some things that teachers can do. All of that will help again, support your students' understanding of themselves, feeling like they belong. And here are some things that we want students to do as they understand themselves as learners. We want them to understand what their strengths are and how to leverage those strengths in different opportunities, right? And so understanding, um, you know, when they feel challenged, like maybe a topic is hard, what are the things they can do well? Well, I can annotate really well, so I'm just going to take this really slow and just annotate every single thing, right? Whatever, whatever their strength is, how can they leverage it when they feel challenged? Um, giving them lots of opportunities to reflect on the learning process and how it changes over time and across content is really important. So making sure that reflecting is part of a regular part of your practice and not just on the content, but on the learning process and really helping students see how they've changed over time because that creates that belief, you know, that they're not fixed in the way that they do something that they can change with effort and grow. And so helping point that out is really important. And then connecting their experiences from the world, community and home to learning is also critical because this taps into their background knowledge, it can also tap into their motivation, which is part of their social and emotional learning. And it can also tap into their cognition with the way the practices and things that they learn at home, such as, you know, storytelling or games and other things. And so really you can hit all four areas um, of the whole child when you're connecting to their experiences. Um, understanding emotions, and their connection to the learning process is also really important um, in helping students understand that sometimes we do get frustrated when we're learning something, right? That's, that's normal, that's okay, right? Like that's part of the process. Here's how we deal with that. Um, and understanding that when we have really strong emotions, it helps us remember things and that can be good or bad, right? If you really don't like something, um, you know, you may have to get past some of those emotions uh, before you can, you know, get in, if you had a bad experience in math, right, people often think of themselves as I'm not a math person, right? How do we kind of uh, help them understand their emotions so they don't feel like they can't be a math person, um, for an example. And then just setting goals and advocating for their needs. So 
um, helping them set some goals and then helping them advocate for when they need help and support and making sure that they feel comfortable doing that. I know that's something I work with my middle schooler on is advocating for herself because she doesn't often want to do that, um, but that's really uh, important. So how is technology being used? Well, I'm gonna share a few different tools with you. One that I've already mentioned is the Learner Variability Navigator. It is a free tool and it gives you, um, I'll just quickly show you a couple other things. So we looked at a specific factor and saw the summary. But one of my favorite things is just kind of looking at the uh, factor map overview and seeing all the different factors that are there and seeing how they're connected. And so I think this really shows how when you're exploring different aspects of content, it really is engaging the whole child, right? It's engaging those cognitive factors, those emotional factors and student background factors. So seeing those connections is really powerful for uh, me as an educator, but I also think it can be helpful for your students to understand, to know that, you know, being successful in things is also, you know, about understanding how they work and how they're unique um, and special. And so uh, that's what you can find here. And then you can also um, look at all the strategies that we have for a specific learner model. Again, I'm showing you literacy 712, but we also have a math model um, and an adult learner model as well as younger models. Here, when you see the strategies, you can um, filter them across several different factors that you're interested in. So you can look at a few, and as you do that, it's going to show you just the strategies that support all the factors you've selected. Again, hopefully, if you've you know, been teaching for um, more than one year, you're probably familiar with a lot of these strategies, but it's just helping highlight those connections between how this supports different factors. So you can be more intentional about selecting these strategies to support your students. So we'll be using this uh, tool a bit in our activity today, but I also wanted to show, move into our second objective, which is um, showcasing some ways that teachers have taught their students about learner variability. So we have um, a, a poster which you can download off of our website for students and hang in your classroom if you like, but it's just kind of asking these questions to get them to be reflective and understand that these different aspects of themselves all impact how they show up in the classroom and, and their readiness to learn that day. And so um, you can use this poster um, in your classroom or add it to a slide to kind of start that conversation. And we'll also be sharing with you a student activity guide. Now it's not published yet. So I'm sharing with you a Google doc version, which is the draft today, but I am glad to follow up and, and add the link once it's published at the end of the month to our, our, our full guide. But it has a lot of language in it about, you know, how to explain things in student friendly terms. And so whether you're a middle school teacher or, you know, a first grade teacher, you know, you can kind of adapt this language um, to be accessible to your students. But this is basically written as in words that a first grader would understand. So, and you can make it more complex, you know, from there. Uh, but this guide will have different ways to kind of talk about the whole child uh, with students. And then I wanted to share a few examples um, based on the guide of what educators have done. So, and this, the lessons for the first example is first grade, but I know most of you are probably middle school. So don't worry, I have a middle school example coming up next. So just bear with me through <laughs> this younger example, but I, I just wanna show you kind of the range of activities um, to get your creative juices flowing. So in the lesson example here that's seen in the student guide, uh, this teacher, spent five days kind of going through um, each aspect of that uh, whole learner framework. So kind of starting with um, content knowledge and then going into cognitive and, and SEL and then student background. And each time the students kind of would think about different aspects of themselves that showed up in those domains and they designed this glyph 
that has, you know, shows that three eyes and two eyes mean different things and different shaped arms and colors are all reflecting the different choices and things that they feel make them who they are as learners. And so when you put them all up collectively, students have a deeper understanding that everyone is different, everyone's unique, that's okay. It's okay for me to be different. And so um, it included some different uh, reproducible activities about being an expert in different things and what they have a lot of knowledge about. And so that's just an example um, of that set of lessons. And so my middle school example is a little different. Um, for this example, we were actually kind of bringing this out towards the end of the year. And so we were like, how can we make this relevant? And, you know, towards the end of the year, and we knew that students were getting ready to take assessments. They were having a lot of anxiety because for many students, they hadn't taken assessments for a couple of years. And for some of them, this was like their first time. And so we, using the navigator, we designed this workspace, which you can do um, by going to the tools and clicking on learner centered design tool. And here um, we uh, identified certain factors that we felt like um, were ones you wanted to consider when preparing students for assessments. And then we organized strategies around different aspects um, of this, such as like mindset and motivation, but also addressing anxiety, building stamina, metacognition, things like that. And so when we were working, this a coach and I were working with one particular teacher, she was very interested in expressive writing. And so in her what she chose to do is an expressive writing activity, which you can hear more about on her video. Um, and it comes from Character Lab. And basically it's where students select um, different values that are important to them and kind of write about their strengths in these values and affirm you know, their sense of belonging uh, around those values prior to going into the assessment. And so that just, kind of helps establish their sense of themselves as learners who belong in this academic setting, which reduces their anxiety and hopefully frees up working memory uh, a bit more to help them on the assessment. And so that is another way it can look <laughs> uh, more in a like isolated lesson and different opportunities um, to kind of, again, help students understand themselves as learners. So I wanted to pause there, I've been talking a lot, and see if anyone had any uh, burning questions just about learner variability or as we're kind of transitioning into thinking about how to teach learner variability to students based on these two examples that I've shared with you so far, are there any questions about teaching this? Sequences of activities for ongoing growth. I think um, that's a great question, Bernie. So this definitely is something I think you would want to, it's not just like a one and done kind of thing, right? So I think you can certainly choose to introduce it through maybe a series of lessons or conversations, but it's definitely something you're gonna wanna come back to over time um, through different reflection activities um, and opportunities to learn about different strategies. This strategy helps you cope with emotions. This strategy helps you reduce anxiety, you know, things like that, like bringing that up, I think is one way um, to do that. But I think figuring out how to make it ongoing and build it in are important. Um, there are also two other ed tech tools that uh, can be helpful in kind of, again, helping students see themselves as learners who belong in an academic setting. And so uh, these two tools are also linked and explained a bit more in our guide. Um, and so I'm just going to flip over there to show you. This is the draft of our guide. Um, it will be pretty um, at the end of June, and I can send it back out to everyone. Uh, but it kind of gives you an overview of learner variability and some talking points to share with students here, um, as well as strategies. And so Bernie, this may be a good place to kind of come for like ways to think about integrating some of these strategies uh, for ongoing growth. And then thinking about how to teach it, um, 
you know, another thing is just to use like comparisons and think about ways in which plants or animals have similarities, but also need different things, right? A cactus doesn't need the same thing um, as another kind of plant, like a rose. This is the kinds of things I'm learning as someone who likes gardening. So, uh, you know, making those comparisons is, is also true for people, right? Um, someone may need a lot of, uh, to hear things multiple times, someone else may not, right? So understanding that we're all different in that way. Uh, the first grade lesson that I showed is has links here. So if you want to see all of her reproducibles, there's links to um, her lesson on Canva and also the slides that she used to kind of get some of these concepts across to her first graders. Um, there's also this ongoing um, Google Doc reflection, again, written for first graders, but could certainly be adapted and uh, could create something uh, similar for older students, but it's just to, how she checks in with them since the unit to see how they're reflecting and growing on their learning. And then here are the um, two tools that we uh, shared along and Black Genius Planning. And so this, you know, talks, a, gets a little bit more at some of the SEL and sense of belonging aspects um, that we mentioned are important for students to really have an understanding of themselves. So all of this is uh, in the guide, which you'll have, you have a link to our draft um, here until the final version is, is published. So hopefully that gives you some ideas about how you might teach this to learn a variability. Um, I want to check in. Our, I'd love to hear um, in the chat. Are you, which one are, are you? Are you unclear about how to teach learner variability? Do you kind of understand the purpose of teaching learner variability to students? Do you feel like you could explain how to teach learner variability to students to other teachers? So if you're wherever you are between a one and a three, you want to go ahead and Oh, I'm supposed to wait. You're supposed to. <laughs> we're doing this waterfall style. Um, you can put it in the chat, and then I'll say go. Sorry, Carolyn, I didn't say that part. Okay, everyone has their number. Yeah. All right. A lot of twos. I'm feeling. I'm feeling good about that. Saw 2.5 and 1.5 is okay too. Great, or okay also. <laughs> um, awesome, so what we're gonna do now is move into breakout rooms for a little bit of time. Of course, I took a little too long talking, so we'll do about 15 minutes total. So you can spend, uh, is that enough time? Um, so we have a little time to come back. You think Todd, 15 minutes? Yeah, okay. So 15 minutes total, take a little time to look through the field guide or check out the workspace, whichever one really resonated with you. And then think about some activities that you might use or try to teach your students about learner variability. And we're gonna do this in breakout rooms so that you have some brainstorm partners to kind of help get your juices flowing um, share other resources that they may know about. And uh, you can put your activities on this Jamboard. So you can put any key points that you feel like are important uh, for your students to understand about learner variability here. And then on the second page, what activities, ideas, or tools are you really gonna try to use to support your students? And so would love to hear some ideas, would love to um, if you have great ones, feel free to share them with me um, because we'd love to be able to share more ways that people are teaching their students about learner variability. So we're going to go into breakout rooms for about 15 minutes. Um, and so please add your ideas to the Jamboard as you guys are sharing them. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I know that wasn't a lot of time. I'm sorry. I, I, I did so much talking at the beginning, um, but I hope that you will 
go through those resources. You can email me if you have other questions or wanna dive into this more. Um, I'm happy to try to respond to some in the chat. Uh, and, but I did just wanna say, I enjoyed joining one group and having a great conversation um, about not having space and time to do a lot of SEL and really thinking about ways you can integrate it um, into the learning. Uh, so when you don't have a lot of space and time. And so I just wanted to name that it, it doesn't have to be this fancy set of lessons, um, you know, which it's great if it is, but it, it, it can't always be that. But just having those ways to authentically connect with kids to build in some skills and small instruction around how to manage, you know, your emotions or reflect on things is, is also a, a perfectly great and necessary part of of helping students understand themselves as learners. So thanks for all that you shared um, on the Jamboard and in your sessions. And I think we need to move on. <laughs> so I'm turning it over to Todd. The attendance and the feedback survey is in the chat now and the link is there. So uh, make sure that if you want, you have to request that you will receive a certificate of completion via email. And let's go to the next one. <clears throat> Oh, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> and then make sure you have registered or are looking forward to registering uh, for our upcoming workshops as the uh, Summer of Powerful Learning series progresses. So next week, next Tuesday, we have Coaching Towards Personal and Accessible Instruction. And I will put that in the chat as well. So make sure that you are checking those out. Those go all the way through uh, the remainder of June, July, and the beginning of August, all except for the week of 4th of July. And then we have one more slide, okay, which is the uh, Ville HQ, and I'm going to put that in there as well, which has AR and VR apps and professional learning lesson plans and all sorts of resources for uh, all of the attendees to check out. There's also more on learner variability in the Bills HQ too. So you can check those out if you want to learn more about what we talked about today. <laughs> and we did have a, I had a question before that, that I just wanted to answer for everyone as well. Um, the question was, uh, is the slide deck somewhere where we can ac access it? Yes, uh, it is accessible through that same link. So all you have to do is bookmark it. Uh, that link, it will remain active for the foreseeable future. So uh, it will be there and you can always go back to it. So make sure you bookmark it if there are things you wanna go back to. And remember that that slide deck does contain all the links that we put in the chat as well, um, which will not be accessible uh, by clickability. And with that, well, we got a minute to spare. Look at that, Jessica. So write it right on time. Um, with that, I just want to extend a big thank you to uh, everyone who, again, took some time out of their day to join us here uh, at the Summer of Powerful Learning session, the first one. So uh, hopefully we can see you next week and beyond. So everybody have a great, great rest of your day, and we will see you soon.